Hey everyone, this is Shintai, and here with me I have a very special guest. This is voice actor Crispin Freeman. How are you doing, sir? Greetings, I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, I'm doing very good. Thank you for asking. I know I just said that you were a voice actor, but to the uninformed audience, in case they don't know who you are, do you mind giving a bit of an introduction to who you are and maybe a few other things that you do besides voice acting? Sure, no problem. I work primarily as a voice actor. I work in animation, video games, and Japanese animation. People in the anime world may know me from Helsing, Ghost in the Shell, Howl's Moving Castle, all sorts of different projects, Naruto that I work on. In the video game world, I've been in many things, Diablo 3. Three, God of War 3, Resistance 3, lots of threes. <laughs> I've sort of run the gamut. In American animation, I've been in Spectacular Spider-Man, Young Justice, worked on a couple episodes of Wolverine and the X-Men and Avengers. So the best way to look me up, go to my website at crispinfreeman.com, and there's a link to my listing on the Internet Movie Database at IMDb, which has a sort of pretty comprehensive list of the stuff that I've been in. While I work primarily as a voice actor, I also run two different websites. One is on voice acting. It's called Voice Acting Mastery at voiceactingmastery.com. It's a podcast on voice acting, which I've been running for about three years now, which is sort of mind-blowing to me. But I've been running the podcast for three years, trying to help people understand what it really takes to work as a professional voice actor. Again, you can listen to the podcasts at voiceactingmastery.com, and you can also subscribe to it in iTunes. So if you do a search under my name in iTunes, it'll pop right up, and you can sign up and listen to it for free through iTunes. I also offer classes through my website at Voice Acting Mastery. I offer classes in Los Angeles and online. I have an online voice acting workshop that I do as well. And I've had students from as far away as Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Japan, as well as all over the United States as well. In addition to my voice acting mastery website, I'm also a bit of a mythology scholar. I give presentations at academic conferences and film festivals and conventions and whatnot. And I talk about mythology and how it affects storytelling and pop culture. And I have a website for that, which is called Mythology and Meaning. Dot com. You can read descriptions of the different panels that I perform at all these different events. I have five different animation mythology panels, and I also have five different panels on the mythology behind sci-fi and fantasy films, and in the future I'll be developing presentations on the mythology behind video games. But all those you can reach from CrispinFreeman.com. If you go to CrispinFreeman.com, there's not only my demos and a link to my resume, but there's also direct links to both the voice acting website and the mythology website, if you are so inclined to check them out. Excellent. That was a lot more comprehensive than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> First thing I wanted to ask was, this is probably a rather generic question, but I think it's something that people who don't know you may want to know about. And that is how you got into voice acting. Yes. Well, I actually tell a quite detailed blow-by-blow -blow description of how I got started both as an actor and as a voice actor on my podcast. It's actually episode four and five of my podcast, or how I broke into voice acting. Ah. So if you want to know all the gory details, you can check out the podcast. But in a nutshell, I was a theatrical actor. I had done theater in high school, college, majored in theater, minored in computer science, then went and got a master's degree in New York City for acting, was working as a theatrical actor actor when I got involved in anime dubbing in New York City, then realized that I really had a passion for animation, and so moved out to Los Angeles at the end of 2001 to pursue voice acting and animation more full-time, and I've been out here in LA voice acting ever since. Excellent. I will be sure to put your podcast in the description below for anyone who wants to hear that full story of yours, they can go ahead and do that. Cool. This was actually mentioned on your podcast as well. Something that I always found kind of interesting interesting was the differences between doing a voice for an anime as opposed to a video game. Real quick, if you could do a quick rundown of that as well, I'll also link the podcast episode in the description. I'd like if you could real quick just detail that as well. Sure. The main challenge in working on Japanese animation is that the animation is done first, and then the voice actor has to match their performance to the lip flaps of the characters on the screen, also known as ADR or dubbing. This is how it's done in Japan as well. They animate first in Japan and then have the Japanese voice actors dub their parts into the animation. The main difference between the dubbing in Japan and the dubbing in America is that in Japan, they all dub all the actors together. It's sort of like a radio play 
high, where everyone's in the room at the same time, and when it's time for a character to speak, they walk up to one of the three or four microphones and they do their thing, and when they're done, they sort of step away and someone else steps up. In America, we don't really do that with anime. In anime, we record everyone separately, one at a time. I think there's been a couple of experiments where they've done like two people at a time when it's a show where there's like two characters that are talking to each other the entire time. But I've never worked on anything like that. Whenever I've worked on anime, it's always been just by myself recording my character and trying to record the lip flaps of the character on the screen. Video games usually aren't done that way, unless it's a Japanese video game. If it's a Japanese video game and they have animation in the game, then we have to do dubbing just like we would if it were anime. Makes sense. Yeah, but most of the time in video games, and even in Japanese video games, there's times when there is no picture because these are going to be the lines that come out of your character as they move around the world or as they interact with other people. And so we have to record those characters wild, which means not to picture, which means we can use, usually we can use our own rhythms. Sometimes if we have to match a game from another country, there's a certain time limit. So the line can't be longer than the way it was in the original Japanese. That's the case with Japanese games, but certainly with domestic games, with American games like Diablo 3, and we don't have to worry about that at all. We just have to perform the character the best we can. The challenge with video games is that most of the time they're sort of non-linear. They're not necessarily one story path. Diablo 3 is a notable exception. Diablo 3 is more linear in its storytelling than, say, World of Warcraft. Because of that non-linear sensibility in the video games, it can be hard as an actor to try to figure out what the through line of the story is. So I like to call video game acting Rubik's Cube acting. You have to be able to sort of recombine your lines in any possible order, and they still have to sound believable. And this can be quite challenging to make that happen. A lot of times in video games, you're acting without a lot of context because you're not quite sure where you fit in the game. You're not quite sure what came before. You're not quite sure what's going to come after. And that's challenging because usually what makes acting specific and believable is context, knowing where your character came from and where your character might be headed in the future. And without that, you're sort of adrift. And so you have to depend on your director quite a bit to make sure that your performance in a video game is going to fit into the larger whole well. Because the thing about games now, though, of course, is that they're sort of big and expansive. Any game with voice acting of any amount usually tends to be very large. And so there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. It's not just a two hour movie. There could be hours and hours and hours of content that you've got to fill with voice acting. So it can be hard to know how you fit in the larger picture because you don't have one story that you can hang on to. So that's sort of the challenge with video game acting. It's sort of acting with usually without a whole lot of context. Very interesting. As a big video game and anime fan as well, I've been hearing your voice for years now. I'm going to go ahead and ask you about a few specific roles, if you don't mind. Sure. So I think this might have been the earliest I've ever heard your voice, and that was in the game Tales of Symphonia, where you played as a character named Regal. Do you remember this role? I do remember playing Regal Bryant, who was in love with Prisea, I believe was her name, and I remember one of his attacks was Swallow Kick. This was a character that I felt was a little more complex than the other characters in the game, and I thought your voice suited him perfectly. Oh, well, thank you. I just wanted to ask, with this character, would it be fair to say that this was one of your earlier roles? In video games? It probably was. It's hard for me to remember what my earliest video game roles were. I'd probably have to go look on IMDB to check the dates of things. But yeah, Tales of Symphony was probably pretty early in the process. Let's say if you were to look at your performance of a game like this again, now with hindsight view, do you think that this performance of yours, like, I don't know how well you remember it, but do you still feel that it holds up because I know personally as being a content creator of sorts it is hard for me to go back to my old content I was wondering if it was the same for you looking back in some of your old work yeah that it depends I haven't actually gone back and looked at my work in Tales of Symphonia for a long time I imagine we did it probably almost 10 years ago now I don't remember exactly what we did back then but I have gone back and listened to some of my work from that time period in other games and whatnot and for the most part in the games stuff, I'm usually pretty happy with what I did. I usually don't think, oh, I could have done it so much better if I just go back and do this other thing. Usually the only time I do that is sometimes with my early anime work. And that's only because there's this lip flap we have to match. And when I was first starting out in anime, my acting was still pretty good, but every once in a while I would try to match the lip flap a little too slavishly, or I should have just put some more words in rather than stretch those words so much to match the lip flap. And that's more of trying to balance the technical with the emotional 
emotional side of the performance. And now I think, well, I'm a better writer now. I could have rewritten that line and made it better. And so I think to myself, oh, I could go back and do it better now. But you know what? People go back and they listen to that stuff and they'll tell me that that's some of their favorite work that I've done. And so I go, okay, somebody likes it and that's cool. I find that when people go back and try to fix their older work because they think it's broken, often it's not broken, but they break it when they try to go back and fix it. George Lucas is sort of famous for that. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but... <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he goes back and he redoes these films that were quite fine, thank you very much. They didn't need to be redone. And most of the stuff that he added on to them just sort of gilded the lily. It made it too Baroque and complicated, and it actually obscured what was so wonderfully pure about it. So while sometimes I'll think, oh, maybe I could, I have to go, no, 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 it's fine, just the way it is. The only time I would be upset with myself is if I didn't try my best. If I went back and listened to something and said, ah, oh, Crispin, you phoned that in. You didn't even try on that one. Then I'd be upset with myself. But that's never been my way of acting. If I'm going to act a character, I'm I'm going to do that character to the best of my ability. And so I may go back and think, well, now I have more experience as an actor and I've got more skills and maybe I could do that character with a certain different panache or something. But as I listen to my performances from the past, I go, well, back then I was doing the absolute best I could and that's all you can do. And I think you can feel that even if it's maybe a little rough around the edges. If it feels like someone's really doing the absolute best they can, you go, all right, I'm cool with that. That was great. I think that's going to be very inspirational to any aspiring voice actors listening to this. I think it's a very good attitude to have. Oh, good. The next role I want to ask you about is something much more recent, and that is your performance as Sundowner in Metal Gear Rising. Yes, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. I didn't realize Revengeance was a word, but I guess it is now. Actually, it's Old English. Oh, really? So there we go. I'm in good company with Chaucer. <laughs> I am a huge fan of the Metal Gear series. I played through Rising. I loved Sundowner's character, but I didn't even realize it was you <laughs> until afterwards. Yep, and not many people did. That role seems very different from what you usually do, not just in your vocal performance, but just like the type of character. Maybe it's just me, I haven't seen enough of your work, but how was it doing that character? Because he seemed like a lot of fun, but he also seemed like he was hard to pull off. He was technically challenging. Voice director on that was Chris Zimmerman, and Chris and I have worked on many different video games together. Chris has sometimes cast me as very sort of proper fantasy characters. For instance, Helios in God of War 3, where I played the sun god. And that's sort of right in the smack dab Royal Shakespeare Company, Lord of the Rings world, which I tend to be good at. But she's also used me in military fighting games like SOCOM and whatnot. And she knows that I can do a bit of a sort of either a Southern or a Western accent. My mom was raised with West of the Mississippi. And so I can tap into that part of my culture. But it's usually pretty muted, shall I say, when we're doing the military games. Like they don't want someone too over the top or too much like a country bumpkin. But when Metal Gear Rising Revenge came along she said well I know you can do that southern sort of thing can we go like full-on southern maybe even Texan and make him really big and dramatic and so I did what I thought was really big and dramatic and she kept saying more <laughs> And I was like, really? M more than that? She's like, yeah, more. And so I'd give her more, and then she'd go, yeah, even more. And I'm like, really? I'm, this is getting pretty huge here. And she's like, I want it all. And I was like, okay. And that's when I just sort of pulled all the stops and said, you want him big and crazy? I will give you as big and crazy as I can possibly be. And so he's right on the edge of what my voice can handle without getting blown out. I walk that line to make sure that I can do him nice and loud and aggressive, but I don't want to damage my voice. And he's right there on the edge. If I push anymore, I'd probably end up hurting myself. I'm glad you didn't hurt yourself, but I loved your performance as Sundowner. I think he's such a fun character. Excellent. I enjoyed playing him. I always worked out all my aggression. By the end of a recording session, I was all mellow, you know, because I'd sort of screamed and gotten all that out. And so I was like chill and, you know, just wanted to hang out. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Shintai from the future, at least as far as this interview goes. Unfortunately, I realized afterwards that this upcoming part, we spoiled some pretty significant things in the anime series Fate Zero. If you're interested in watching that show and you don't want to be spoiled, then I suggest skipping to the timestamp that I have presented in the video. Be sure to do that because Fade Zero is a great show that is very much worth watching. You do not want to be spoiled on this. Anyways, I'm sorry to interrupt and I hope you enjoy the rest of the interview. Switching from video game rules now to some of your anime rules, a role that you did somewhat recently, one that I absolutely adore, is your performance as Kotomine Kire in Fate Zero. 
Mm, yes. I absolutely love the Fate series. I thought your performance as this character was perfect. I had no issues with it. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Trust me, I know a lot about the source material, so I know this character pretty well. And I think you did beautiful. I would not have changed a single thing about your performance. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. What was it like portraying this kind of character where he started off as unsure of himself, man of God, into this relishing in the sorrowness and the depression of others and villain character that just started off so different and became something entirely different? Yeah, I guess that's the question, isn't it? It, did he really start off different? I think that over the course of the story, it's all about Kire admitting who he actually is underneath everything. Yes. Yes. I think that at the beginning of the story, he's incredibly repressed about who he is and what he's actually fascinated by and how he wants to be. And I think that's why the character of Gilgamesh is sort of interested because Gilgamesh wants him to reveal himself. He wants to enjoy watching Kire let go of all of his shackles that are holding him back so that Kire can be this sort of amazing negative force of destruction that Kire seems to want to be. There's something in him that is perverse not in a sexual way, yeah. <laughs> but in that he wants to go against everything that you might call ethical or moral or righteous. I mean, all of that, he pays a lot of lip service to it, but deep down, he actually wants to do the opposite of everything he's supposed to do. And so he has this sort of psychological schizophrenia going on in that one part of him wants to go in one direction and the other part is trying to hold him back. And Gilgamesh wants to see what happens if you let the beast loose and see what comes out. I certainly brought my mythology scholarship to bear on Kire, since there is references to Zoroastrian mythology in the storytelling as well, Ahura Mazda and Agra Mainyu and whatnot. If we're going to deal with that sort of Zoroastrian dualistic notion of good versus evil on a sort of a cosmic scale, that's sort of where a lot of scholars believe the notion of a dualistic cosmos of good versus evil sort of comes from Zoroastrianism. Since the show explicitly references that in the dialogue, it does. I go, okay, well then that's where we are. That's what we're going to deal with and that's what we're going to play with. He's going to be this evil force of destruction. And so how do you sort of manifest that in a human psyche and how does that affect the way he behaves with people? So that was important to understand and it was one of the challenges when they were casting the show because I was friends with a producer. We had worked on Durarara together. She really liked my work and initially she wanted to cast me as a different character in the show. Really? Yeah, she thought I'd be really good as a caster. Hmm. And I said, yeah, I bet I would be pretty good as caster her, but who are you going to get to play Kire? That's always my thing. To me, it's not the character, it's the story. I want the story to be served as well as possible. And so I looked at a character like Kire and I said, I think I understand him better than most anyone. If you think someone can play Kire better than me, by all means, please cast them because I want this story to be done well. So if you've got someone in mind who could really knock Kire out of the park, cast them and then I'll play Caster or whoever else you want me to play. But I have this sneaking suspicion that you're going to have a hard time finding someone who really understands understands Kirei the way I do. And sure enough, after we're done with casting, they said, yeah, you're going to play Kirei. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I had a feeling that's what was going to happen. I like it when I'm cast well, because that means I can win. If I'm cast badly, there's no way I can win. No matter how good an actor I am, if I'm cast in a role that doesn't really suit me, there's no way I can win. So I was happy to be cast well so that we could serve the story well. I was very impressed with your deconstruction of Kotomine's character. I think you were spot on. I think it's very much a nature versus nurture argument within himself. It really was more about him accepting who he was. You're right, you definitely knew him very well. Oh, well, thank you. Another thing I want to ask, though, it's been announced that there's going to be a new series, Fate Stay Night, which is a, kind of a remake. I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do exactly, but sure enough, Kire is going to come back. I would like to ask if you would be interested in portraying the character again, and how would you feel about portraying the character now that he's fully developed and now has embraced who he is? You know, it's funny. I get asked this question a lot. If they brought a show back and your character was in it, would you want to play it? My answer to that is always, do actors refuse work? Good point. Am I an actor? Yes. Then chances are, if they bring the character back, I would love to play it. I'm not quite sure where people get the idea that I have any control over it. It's up to the producers whether they decide to hire me or not. If I'm not mistaken, Fate Zero is the prequel to the original story of Fate Stay Night, which was produced many years ago. Yes. I'm not aware of exactly what this new production is going to be, but there were voice actors they used for Fate Stay Night back in the day, and another voice actor for that earlier series played Kirei. They may choose to 
use him instead of me, and I don't really have any control over that. So it's not as if they come to me and I go, oh, I don't know, I'm sort of bored of getting paid to work as an actor, I guess I won't do this, right? I think that comes from this notion that everyone reads articles about celebrities that have people falling all over them to hand them scripts, and they go, oh, I don't know, should I be in World War Z or 12 Years a Slave, or what should I work on? And that's not the way a working actor works. Certainly not a voice actor. Voice actors don't really refuse work. And why would I refuse to play a character that I enjoyed playing? All right, cool. <laughs> the main crux of the question was, actually, you don't know what the material is going to be, but I was wondering how you would feel about portraying this character who is fully developed, and do you know how your performance is going to change now that this character is the way he is, and how much of your previous work with this character, do you know how much that's going to affect your performance in the next show, or do you kind of see the two in, like, in a vacuum? Assuming that they make this new show, and assuming that they hire me, me to play Kire again, I have no idea how I'm going to play him because I need to see the story first. A lot of people want to think about plot and character as if they are two independent things, but they're not. Character is revealed through plot. Your character doesn't have a personality until we see them in action, and a plot can't move forward without characters. Nothing can happen if there's no one there to do something. So I don't know how I would play Kire until I looked at the show and saw how Kire had been written. I need to see how they wrote Kire, what he does in this show, what his motivation are in this show, that will help me shape how the character will be performed. Case in point, when we worked on Helsing and we did the original Helsing TV series, I got a sense of who Alucard was and I played him to the best of my ability. Then they decided to sort of redo the series closer to the original manga storyline and it was Helsing Ultimate. And you could say, well, isn't it just the same thing over again? And I go, no, it's the same character, but the plot is different. The plot has changed. And that means the character is going to act differently. We're going to see different aspects of of that character's personality, and so I need to make sure that I'm making that character believable in those circumstances, because the circumstances of Helsing Ultimate are different from the circumstances of the original Helsing TV series. So the circumstances of this new Fate Stay Night, whatever it might be, will be different from the circumstances of Fate Zero. And so I need to make sure that the character is believable in those new circumstances. It's not simply a wind-up car where I, I wind it up and it just goes automatically. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> I have to deal with the actual plot in front of me and figuring out how it goes. Fair enough. One other role I would like to talk about, this will be the final role and then we can ask a few other things, and that is your role as Kion from Haruhi Susumiya. Now, this was a very interesting role because it showed like a very sort of sarcastic, laid back kind of character. I'm sure most people would probably think that wouldn't be a very difficult role to portray, but I would say that this character probably talks more than any other character in the show. Yes, he does. He never shuts up <laughs> A little resentment there? No, no, not resentment. It's just hilarious. I mean, he never shut up through the entire TV series, but it really brought home to me when we did the movie, The Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. This movie was over two hours long, and I had to go into the booth to record Kion's part for this two-hour-plus movie. It took an entire month. I spent 45 hours in the booth recording enough Kion to fill two hours of movie because the guy never shut up. He's a talker. That's incredible. A whole month. That's amazing. That's another role I think you did perfect in. Well, thank you. It was work well worth it, in my opinion. He is a challenging character. People think that because he's just sort of casual and laid back, he must be really easy to do. Oh, no. Because that's one of the hardest things to do, especially in dubbing, because we have all of these lip flaps and the beeps are coming at you to tell you when to start speaking, and there's all this technical stuff you have to keep track of. To sound like you're just sort of sitting at home on your couch, chilling, underneath all those really technical demands on you, that's really hard. It takes a lot of mental focus. So while Kion is not necessarily vocally terribly challenging, you know, I'm not screaming and ripping people's heads off and being a monster. I'm, I'm using pretty much my natural voice, just a little lighter. It's very mentally taxing to try to stay that relaxed under those demanding technical conditions. And we could only record for about four hours. Then I'd have to go rest because my voice would start to sound tired 
tired, like I was sort of ragged. One day they said, can we try doing more than four hours? We could do like four hours in the morning and then take a lunch break and come back for another two hours in the afternoon. And I said, we can try it, but I don't think it's going to work. And sure enough, it didn't. We went for four hours, went to lunch, we came back. For the first half hour when we came back, I was sounding all right. And then about halfway through that first hour, my voice started to go. And I was like, guys, I'm sorry. I've been going for four and a half hours. The voice is tired. I don't know what to tell you. And also the challenge is that you have both Kion's outside voice and his inside voice. So there's the voice where he's just talking normally. And then there's the voice when he gets close up to the mic. And when I have to get close up to the mic to do his inside voice, I can't have any lip smacks or any clicks in my mouth or anything. It takes a lot of mental focus. So yes, it is far more difficult to sound casual and cool and off the cuff when dubbing than it is to sound like a maniac. If you have to jump around and scream and go crazy, in many ways that's sort of easier in some ways than trying to be casual and relaxed. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Right when you were just saying that you couldn't do lip smacks, I was just thinking in my head, that must be so difficult to pull off in trying to portray this character. Never mind the scenes in Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumi in the movie where I talk to myself. There's a whole sequence where I argue with myself about what I'm going to do. And I have to not only talk back and forth to myself, but I have to make sure that you can hear the difference between my psyche. But I can't change my voice, right? I can't use my Daffy Duck voice to do the other voice. You know, like I can't do something radical with my voice. It has to be in the acting. <sighs> this takes a lot of focus and a lot of playing stuff back and going, does that sound right? Does it sound like I'm talking to myself? Does it sound like two different aspects of my psyche that are arguing with each other? Or does it just sound like I'm crazy? So yeah, this is a challenging thing. Clearly, I think you've adequately explained why. I've noticed that you've been credited as a voice director from time to time. I'd like to ask, what are the challenges of being a voice director and having to dictate other actors and how you want them to perform? Well, it depends on the medium you're working in. I've worked primarily as a voice director in anime and in video games. I've never voice directed an original American animated TV series, so that has its own challenges. Although, obviously, I've been in the room, so I've watched directors work under those circumstances, but I just don't have personal experience of directing actors in that environment. The challenge, primarily, I would say, in anime and video games is that you're recording every actor alone by themselves, so it's like recording an orchestra one in instrument at a time. And yet they need to sound like they were all in the room at the same time playing together. Mm, this is not easy to lay down all these tracks individually and make sure that they all sort of mesh together in a very nice weave that seems consistent. So the director needs to really have a clear sense of what they're going for, what the overall story is, what they're aiming for. When it comes to directing domestic animation, the difference there is that you're having to manage a lot of different people at once. You've got a line of actors in front of you and you're trying to get the best performance performances and you're trying to sort of play the different actors against each other and see what comes out and see if ooh, ooh, now that he did that maybe she should do that and now that she did that maybe he could react with so there's a lot more room to play to see if you can sort of plus what's going on in a way that's not really possible usually with video games and anime but invariably you're the one throwing the party you're the one making sure that everyone has a good time at the party and you have to be incredibly responsible for what's going on which means that you really care usually about the project it becomes sort of personal for you. That's, I think, usually the biggest challenge as a voice director. And you're usually on the project for quite a long time. If you're directing 26 episodes of a Japanese animated series, half hour each, that could take you, depending on the production schedule, six months. You may not be recording every day of those six months. Oh, no, absolutely not. Each volume of four episodes may take you a week and a half or two weeks to record in the studio. But then you've got another four, maybe six weeks, if you're lucky, to figure out the next scripts and schedule all the actors and do all that kind of stuff. So even when you're not in the studio, you still have to be thinking about the show. If you're doing video games, oh my God. I mean, it depends on the scale of the video game. You may just be directing every day for months to get all the stuff down. I mean, to think about something that's a huge online game like World of Warcraft or something where characters are talking constantly like Dragon Age, the sheer amount of characters that you have to record. Diablo 3, I think I had over 4,000 lines of dialogue in Diablo 3. My God, that's a lot. You're going to be in the studio a lot. When Diablo 3, they had to split it up between two directors because it was just too much for one director. They weren't going to be able to get it done in time. Also, one director would have just gone crazy. They would have burned out. That's the challenge. It's a very different thing. Whereas when you're an actor, you're like a honeybee. You're sort of flitting from one flower to the next. As a director, you're the gardener. You got to make sure everything works in your garden. That's a very interesting way to put it. And I didn't realize it took that long in order to produce a dub for an anime. I had an idea it would probably take a long time for a video game, especially depending on the video game, like an RPG. The industry standard is they would like you, ideally, 
ideally to be able to do 30 loops an hour. So 30 lines of dialogue in an hour is sort of what I'd like to shoot for. That's a little quick. It's usually a little nicer if we have more like 25 or 20 loops an hour. But you work out the math, if you've got 400 lines at 20 loops an hour, it's going to take you a while. You're going to be in the studio for at least a week and a half usually. And depending on the complication of the show, it could be two weeks to get four episodes done, four half hour episodes. Each episode's got 400 loops maybe. And God help you if you've got a show that's very dialogue heavy. A show like Witch Hunter Robin, there isn't a lot of dialogue. But if you're doing a comedy or something that's wacky and zany where the characters are just constantly talking, whew, you know, it may take you a while just to get those episodes done. Dubbing is a time consuming process. Clearly, and you would know better than I. <laughs> I've noticed that you've also been credited as being a script writer for certain things as well. One in particular that caught my eye was that you were a script writer for Gungrave, is that true? Yes. Now, when you say script writer, that's not technically accurate. I was the script adapter. Okay. What I have done primarily is I have adapted scripts for English dubs rather than writing my own original story that is then turned into animation or television or a film. Yes, clearly. But I want to make that distinction so that as a script adapter, I'm not writing the story. I'm taking the story in translation and reworking it so that it'll work well with the English dub actors. So what happens is a Japanese show is brought over. It is translated into English. That translation is usually what is used for the subtitles for the show. But that may not match the lip flap of the characters on the screen. And also sometimes what works best in a visual red translation does not work very well spoken. Spoken. The spoken dialogue and the way you speak language is different from the way you write and read language. So as an adapter, my job is to come in, rework the dialogue so that it matches the lip flap, to make sure that every character is speaking with their own sort of personal voice, to translate whatever cultural references an American audience may not be familiar with so they can still keep the show accessible, and to make the lines sound dramatic and believable. <sighs> This is not easy. I've done this on a number of shows. I think I only did the first episode of Gungrave, but I've adapted the scripts for all the shows that I've directed, including Scrapped Princess, Strawberry Eggs, Space Travelers, and I've also adapted scripts for shows like Witch Hunter Robin, where I adapted the second half of the show. The first half of the show was a different script adapter, but from episode 14 on, I was the script adapter for Witch Hunter Robin. And then back in the day, I used to adapt scripts for Pokemon. For the very first season of Pokemon, I adapted a number of scripts for that show. And Boogie Pop Phantom, his and her circumstances. There's been a couple of different shows that I I've adapted scripts for. Wow, you did Pokemon as well. You're more in my life than I expected. <laughs> well, there you go. I find it interesting, though, how you only did parts of the script adaptation. Is there a particular reason why that would be the case? You mean on Witch Hunter Robin? Well, yes. You said you only did the first episode of Gungrave, and then you only did the second half of Witch Hunter Robin. It depends. Sometimes I get busy doing other things and I don't have time to do it. Uh, I think that's might have what happened with Gungrave. I think they were trying a couple of different writers on Gungrave. And while they had worked with me before and they liked my work, I think what happened was is I agreed to do the first episode sort of as a test. And then I realized that I just didn't have time in my schedule. And so I said, guys, i sorry I can't do this. Because it's very physically taxing, especially on your hands. I almost got sort of carpal tunnel syndrome once working on scripts for too long because you're just typing and mousing and typing typing and mousing and it's tough. On Witch Hunter Robin, I think it was that I was rewriting a lot of my own lines as Amon. And so they said, well, why don't you just rewrite everybody's lines? And I was like, okay, fine. And it may have also been because the writers in the first half of the show got busy with other projects. If you look closely, you'll see that sometimes the bigger the project, the more script writers they have on it. And there's many times when there are multiple script writers working on the same series. And so people get swapped in and out depending on their availability and whether they have time to work on it or not. Okay, that makes sense. Here are a few questions that I got from some friends friends of mine who wanted to inquire certain things about you, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay. One friend of mine asked, what are the top three anime that you voiced in that you enjoyed the most? Hmm, top three anime that I've acted in. Well, I think right there up there at the top would probably be Wolf's Reign, probably my favorite show that I've worked on. I really love Wolf's Reign. That was sort of a dream project come true for me because I got to work with a lot of the artists that I admire. Also, the story itself really appealed to me. Wonderful mythological storytelling in Wolf's Reign. I still think it's probably one of the best dubs ever made, and that's not because I'm in it. Clearly not. <laughs> no, 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 no. The guy who plays Quint in it is just amazing. So really good stuff in that show. I am very fond of Helsing as well, especially now that we've you know been working on the recent uh, Helsing Ultimate. I think there's some really good stuff in Helsing Ultimate. I think also Howl's Moving Castle will always have a sort of sweet spot in my heart because I do love me some Miyazaki. Who doesn't? Yeah, it was really a joy to be able to work on one of his projects. So that would probably be the top three of ones that I've worked on. 
Those are some great choices, I gotta say. This next question is, what is your favorite kind of character to portray? I don't really necessarily have a favorite character. There are characters that I get cast as a lot. The sort of characters that are forces of nature. Alucard is like that. Shizuo in Durarara is like that, where he's picking up vending machines, ripping them out of the ground and throwing them at people. These kinds of characters, they're like hurricanes. They're just like these huge forces of nature. I do like playing those characters only because I feel like I can do them pretty well. And that's usually what it comes down to. I'm a little odd in that as I am an actor, but I have a lot of director in me. I'm usually more focused on the story. If the story is interesting to me, then I'm sort of captivated and I want to contribute to that story as well as possible. It's far more important for me to play a character in a story well than to play a certain type of character. So if you said, oh, this is the coolest character ever, but the show he's in isn't very good, I'd be like, eh, I'm not sure I'm interested. So so invariably on shows that I really like and care about, like Wolf's Reign and even Durarara, when I first looked at those shows, the characters I was thinking that I would want to play were not the characters I was originally cast as. When I looked at Wolf's Reign, I really personally identified with the character of Kiba. He's the sort of lead wolf. And I thought Kiba was really cool. I thought like I understood him. But then when I went to audition, I realized that because I'm a baritone, my voice is a little deeper, the chances were they were going to cast me as Sume, as the sort of rebel character rather than the hero character. I thought, well, that's good because I can play that character too. And in fact, I can probably play that character better than anyone else. So put me there because that's what suits me. That's good casting. And put someone else as Kiba because that'll make the show work. Same in Durarara. When I first walked in, I thought Isaiah was a really cool character. And I thought, ooh, I could play a scheming Isaiah type character. And then the moment they put Shizuo up on the screen, I was like, yeah, but they're going to cast me as Shizuo. <laughs> because that's where my voice sits. That's what works the best. And that makes me happy. If I'm cast as the character that I'm right as, then that makes me happy. But I could have been just as happy playing an Isaiah type character if that suited my voice. So I'm much happier being cast well in a very good show than getting some really interesting character in a show that's not very well written. This ties in to what you were saying before with how you were originally going to be casted as a caster. And you just said, no, I think Kotomine fits me better. And I would agree that you fit that character better and that made the show better. Mm -hmm. And Kira is a much harder character to play. Caster would be a lot more fun because Caster is crazy and he's over the top and he's summoning demons and he's doing all this crazy stuff and actors like to have the freedom to chew the scenery and go melodramatic and over the top. That can be a, a lot of fun doing all that crazy stuff. So I didn't say cast me as Kire because Kire would be more enjoyable. No, Kire was going to be a lot more work and was going to be a lot more difficult to do. It's sort of like Elijah Wood wanting to play Frodo in Lord of the Rings. Frodo is a pretty thick thankless character in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Everyone likes Gollum, everyone likes Gandalf, lots of people like Legolas and the Dwarf and Aragorn, but Frodo has to sort of wander around looking sad and pained and tortured by the ring. This is not easy, right? This is not fun. He's covered in mud and crawling through spider webs and weeping and crying and half naked and beaten up by orcs. And why would you want to do this? Like, that's not the character you necessarily want to do. But Elijah knew from the beginning, that's me. That's the character I should play. I I can't play Samwise, I can't play Marion Pippin, I'm Frodo. And Peter Jackson, you better understand that I'm the best Frodo you're gonna possibly get. And Peter was like, yep, you're Frodo. That's the thing, and I respect that in actors when they go, I know what I'm gonna be good for, I know what's gonna work, and I know what's gonna serve the story, right? That's the whole goal. If Kire had had two lines in the show, I would've been fine, then let me play Kire because that's what he's gonna do. He doesn't have to be the lead. And if it had been the other way around, if Caster had been the main villain in Fate Zero and Kire had a smaller character size, I would have been like, no, don't cast me as caster because no one's going to be able to pull off Kire the way I think I can. And I always leave it up to them. I say, look, if you can find someone you think is better, then please cast them. Do not cast me if you think there is a better actor for this character because serving the story is far more important to me than getting to play a certain character. I play all sorts of characters and I'm going to keep playing characters. So there's no one character that is so damn special that I have to play him. Stories, however... 
Ooh, good stories are hard to come by. When a story comes along and it's good and I get the opportunity to work on that good story, I want that story to be done as well as possible. So I do not want to work and play any character that's not going to work right. The Slayers, one of the first anime series I ever worked on, I play the sort of Oscar the Grouch character who's not far from Kion in the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya in terms of his personality. I play this character Zelgadis, and there's four characters who are the main characters in that show. And arguably, Zelgadis speaks the least. The other characters are talking all the time, and Zelgadis has these sort of short one-liners. Good! That's the character that suits me. I would not work as the other characters, so please cast me as him, because nothing else will fit right. I really respect that. I think that you're absolutely right, because it's really not about you. It is about making this product, whether it be a game or an anime, the best it can be. My fetish is for story. I just really love story. I love good story. I love meaning in story, which is why I do my scholarship. If I could draw, I'd probably be an animator. Animator, but I'm not, so I can't draw really. So I contribute to this medium of animation and video games that I love. I contribute in the way that I know how, which is as a voice actor, as a scholar, as a writer and director sometimes. Those are the skills I have to bring to bear on the storytelling mediums that mean a lot to me. Excellent. This is the uh, final question I have from a friend, and this is, what is your take on the anime industry right now? How do you feel about the way that the anime industry is going? at this moment in time? Well, I think the anime industry is trying to find its legs. There is not nearly as much anime being produced as there was before, or at least there's not as much being dubbed into English. We've seen the anime industry shrink quite substantially over the past five, 10 years. It's been a little depressing to watch, but that is par for the course for animation. Animation comes in sort of boom and bust cycles. So we're at the trough. We're at the bottom of one of these cycles. Something will change and it will come back up again and it will be ascendant again. As always been the case with anime in America, it's been this way. So I think the Japanese have a lot of economic issues they're dealing with, the aging of their population, they've had a lot of economic challenges for the past decade, and I also feel like anime is also struggling with a global marketplace. Japan is just not that used to having to deal with a global marketplace for their content. They're much more used to dealing with just their local Japanese audience for their content. Yes. I agree. They've been a little slow to get on the bandwagon for things like streaming media and streaming Netflix and all this good stuff. And also there's some technical challenges because to be able to stream media and be able to switch the audio tracks and turn subtitles on and off, sometimes that's difficult to execute technically for streaming players depending on the platform you're working on. So there's some technical bugs to be ironed out as well. It's not like a DVD where you can just push the button and it changes. The Japanese can be a little slow to change their business practices. But when one of these studios figures out a formula that works and they find a way to distribute globally, to make the money back that they want to make back, and they become successful at it, then you're going to watch everyone else follow their pattern and run down the races, and then we're going to have a big boom again. So it's just going to be a matter of time before some studio or network figures out how to do that, and then everyone's going to copy them, and then we'll have a huge new influx of anime that we've never seen before. That's a very optimistic viewpoint. I like that. Last thing I'm going to ask is just very simple. I just wanted to ask you about, you know, what some of your interests are. Like, maybe if you want to talk about a favorite anime of yours, or if you want to talk about a favorite game of yours, or something else entirely, just some of your interests. Well, to be perfectly frank, my interests are my scholarly pursuits. Most people have music on their iPods and iPhones. My iPhone is filled with lectures. In my spare time, I learn things. I sort of can't help myself. I'm always curious and expanding my knowledge about stuff. And if you want to keep Crispin happy, put him in front of a TV or an iPad with a whole stream of really cool documentaries and lectures about cool subjects, and I just won't move. I'll be happy as a clam. So that's usually when I'm not doing my voice acting work or my voice acting classes and coaching when I'm not helping other people figure out how to get into the industry. I'm working on my scholarship and I'm trying to share what I love about storytelling. I'm trying to explain the sort of blueprint behind storytelling, the mythological and religious influences on pop culture heroes and how they work structurally and the different cosmologies that these different stories take place in and hero journeys and all that kind of stuff because it's just fascinating. It's the sort of programming language of our life. Humans are the animals that 
that tell stories. That's one of our huge evolutionary advantages is that we pass information from one generation to the next. Every generation of humanity builds on the information of the generation before. The best way that humans share information is by story. That's the way you remember things the best. I don't know why. That's just the way our brains have adapted, that we can remember things in story format much better than we can remember it in a list. List goes right out of our heads. You tell me a story about it, I'll probably never forget it. That's our advantage over other animals. And I think it's really useful to use that to one's advantage, both creatively when you were trying to tell stories in any different format or medium, and also personally, because your life is a story. And if you want to be the authority of your own life, to literally author, to write your own life, to be the authority, then it behooves you to know about story and decide what kind of story you want your life to be. And that's really where a lot of my scholarship and inspiration for my scholarship comes from. Excellent. I think that's pretty much it. I want to thank you, Crispin Freeman, for joining me. This was such a pleasure to talk to you and get to hear you talk about all the different roles that you've been in and to have this very nice experience talking to you. Oh, good. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. This has been Shintai with Crispin Freeman. Please, in the description below, check out his website, his podcast, and be sure to hear out his voice in any new anime or video games. I'm sure you're probably here because he's got a very distinct voice unless he does sound downer again then you probably won't know it <laughs> <laughs> exactly thank you very much thank you take care everyone <laughs>